Just ahead on a special edition of American Black Journal, we're taking an in-depth look at the turbulent summer of 1967. We'll talk about what sparked the Detroit Rebellion, police and community relations, what arose from the ashes, and the impact on the city today. Stay right there. You don't want to miss this very important conversation. American Black Journal on the road starts now. American Black Journal on the Road is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. For Fun gave me a scholarship to help me attend Eastern Michigan University. I developed a passion for engineering at an early age. It started off with something as simple as fixing bikes. I didn't know anything about a bike shop or where I could go to get it fixed, so I just kind of had to play around with it myself. You can't really do everything on your own, so with even the smallest amount of help, just a little push, it can get you to where you need to be. This program is also made possible by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. We're coming to you from the Joseph Walker Williams Community Center on Rosa Parks Boulevard in Detroit. This is the neighborhood where the 1967 rebellion began on this very day, July 23rd. Today's program is part of our One Detroit commitment to examine the city's most important issues. We'll reflect on what happened 50 years ago and how it impacts Detroit moving forward. We want to welcome our audience members and invite our viewers at home to comment on Facebook and on Twitter. We start with a closer look at the issues that sparked the uprising. The media partners in the Detroit Journalism Cooperative conducted a year-long investigation on the state of social and economic conditions 50 years later. The findings are published in a book titled The Intersection from Bridge Magazine. Joining me now are Lester Graham of Michigan Radio, journalist Bill McGraw, and Keith Owens from the Michigan Chronicle. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Lester, let's start with you. Talk about what we've learned about 50 years ago, uh, 50 years later. Well, I think one of the things that was surprising to a lot of us was this, as we looked at things like housing, poverty, education, and so forth, that in many cases, the people, the black people of Detroit are in worse shape than the black people of Detroit were in 1967. There's one exception to that. There, uh, there are better relationships with the police, uh, but beyond that, things have not improved much and sometimes gotten worse. Yeah, uh, Bill, you were a young man in 1967 here uh, in Detroit. Uh, you've been a journalist in this community for a really long time, almost since that that point. Uh, talk about the things that we've learned about ourselves over that 50 years based on what, what happened in 67. Well, um, I think in 67, after what happened, people started paying attention to what was going on in Detroit, even beyond police community relations, education, and that was the deindustrialization of Detroit. And um, I think until 67, it was operating at a lower level. Not everybody quite understood the impact of what happened in the 50s when Packard closed and Hudson closed and all those parts supplier closed. So there was an economic, um, uh, economic crisis going on in Detroit at a kind of a lower level until 67 brought a lot of attention, I think, to everything going on in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Keith, you're the editor of the Michigan Chronicle, mm -hmm. uh, the newspaper that speaks to African Americans mm -hmm. here in the city of, of Detroit. Talk about the things that you feel like we've learned about that, that community, our community, 
uh, over 50 years based on the, what happened in 67. Well, I think one thing we've learned, which is what we know, is that we're very durable. <laughs> um, <laughs> resilient they, is the resilient, word we always right, use, right? Resilient is probably a better term. But I think that um, following up on what Lester said, I mean, the, the problem is that there's a lot of focus, not to be the dead horse, there's a lot of focus in terms of what's happening downtown, which we're very happy with. And, and there are good things that are happening outside of downtown, it's not just downtown, but there are still some things that are troubling the community, ex exception, the poverty rate is high, the illiteracy rate is very high, um, the, the number of jobs, the times of jobs that are available, the jobs that we anticipate will become available in the new economy. Too many Detroiters are not qualified for that. The school system is still struggling. And, so, and a lot of that is because of what happened in 67. There was a lot, there was disinvestment, there was disinterest, there was a, you know, pulling away from that. And, and I think that when you talk about the effects, the overall effects of racism and people understanding what that, what that can really do. People, I think, sometimes understand racism is just, you know, black folks, white folks don't like black folks, something like that. It's much more intense, much deeper than that. And I think that what, is, what Detroit has really kind of um, become a s emblem of, a symbol of, unfortunately, is what, Ra you know, what intense, concentrated racism can do to an entire community. Yeah. You know, and it's almost devastated to say. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, Lester, talk about w what has happened over the last 50 years that reproduces these stats over and over again. Was there a period where things got better and they slipped back, or have we sort of stayed in the same place for that long? I think that I think what's happened is, you know, starting in the 50s with, as Bill mentioned, the decline of industry, the increase in automation, white flight, uh, and then after 67, increased white flight, uh, and then as crime uh, rose in the city, middle class black flight, uh, and so uh, it left the city hurting in a way that it had never been before. Yeah. So I think it's been a, a, a tough uh, road a hoe for Detroit for, for a few decades yeah, now. Yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, what do you make of the things that we're seeing now uh, in Detroit, this sort of uh, excitement and enthusiasm about the things that we're seeing in places like downtown and midtown? Uh, how does that relate to what is going on in the rest of, of Detroit? Well, there was a lot of excitement about Detroit in 1967, too. That's right. Um, People have probably seen, <coughs> excuse me, the um, film clip of Mayor Kavanaugh singing Detroit's praises on a... Uh, Pitching us for the Olympics, Well, right? a little earlier yeah. than that, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, um, you know, there were some buildings built downtown in the 60s, and, um, but I don't think um, that masked what was going on at the street level. Uh, abuse of citizens by the police, the inequality. Uh, what's going on today? Uh, there certainly are a lot of uh, very exciting things happening in Detroit, and uh, but it's what about 10 square miles, unfortunately, right. and um, you know so much of the rest of the city is still hurting and still struggling. Yeah, uh, education in particular, Keith, has been something that we just haven't we haven't gotten right, uh, and that's now my entire lifetime uh, mm -hmm. in Detroit. We've we've really struggled with that. Um, what what are we doing wrong? What are we not thinking of? to move this community forward on that front? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a large question. I mean, <laughs> there's an awful lot involved with that. Yeah. But I think that what we need to focus on basically is number one, what education needs to be, what it needs to do, you know, both in terms of, it's, it's obviously needs to be more than just preparing for a job, but it needs to be connecting that to the jobs, where the jobs are going to be, and the condition of the schools right now. You know, and also, I think we need to focus on um, what's, you know, what's going right. I mean, there are, there are a lot of teachers who are working extremely hard, some excellent teachers, some excellent principals who are doing everything they can against tremendous odds, you know, I mean, working with, these, with, with children, doing everything they can, what they need is support, you know, I think from what I've seen of the, the new superintendent, it seems to be, I think he's saying some of the right things, you know, what needs to be focused on, of focusing on, you know, public schools in terms of getting, you know, getting the resources that we need, um, the teachers, there's just so much that Detroit schools need, I mean, and once again, I think the thing that needs to be understood, I think everybody's not saying anything that hasn't been said before, but um, um, we can't, you can't say Detroit is back if the schools aren't back. Right. You know, right. if the children aren't back, the city's not back. Right. You know, and I, and I think that needs to be understood. Right. Well, let's start talking about the things that would, would cast us forward 50 years so that we're not sitting around uh, in 2067 uh, saying, oh, we, 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 do, we haven't moved anywhere uh, in, another, in another 50 years. What are the things that we really got to 
drill down on? Uh, well, the biggest <laughs> thing is white people have to learn to talk about race yes. in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to understand why racial history in this country has caused the things that we have today. That's going to be tough. That's a very a tough of, uh, nut to crack even now. But, you know, we talked about this 50 years ago when the Kerner Commission was appointed by President Johnson to look into the civil disturbances across the country. And the finding then was we're creating two societies, one white, one black, equal, uh, separate and unequal. Yeah. And, and we're still there. And that is something we've got to deal with. We've known about it for a long time. And, and if you've got an answer, I want to listen. <laughs> I don't. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Bill, to talk uh, last about that, that point. You're a longtime member of this community. Are we seeing an opening to get that conversation started between black people and white people about this? Well, you decision? know, a lot has changed in 50 years, certainly, uh, you know, um, and the, the discussion has changed in many ways, too. But the um, Kerner Commission also said that the institutions and the reason that all these cities in America erupted in the 60s was because of white racism. And um, I think it's fair to say whites have been reluctant to accept that responsibility. Um, maybe there's at least a discussion about things like that, but I don't know how far into various communities it filters down. Yeah. All right, guys, great work, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. The past 50 years have brought a lot of change to the intersection of what was 12th and Claremont, where the rebellion began. The businesses are long gone, replaced by a small green space called Gordon Park. The park was refurbished just in time for the anniversary of the uprising. Detroit's Gordon Park. 50 years ago, it was here a police raid sparked a week of citywide looting, burning, and killing. Lamont Causey lived right near here. He was eight years old. We grew up over here in this community called 12th Street at the time in uh, Claremont. My family had moved over here in the early 40s. We was one of the first African-American families over here. Causey leads Brothers Always Together, a volunteer group that's the keeper of the flame at Gordon Park, working with the city to bring it back to life. Well, didn't it come out great? So I've been here several times with uh, Lamont and Brothers always together with the events, and, and it was okay the way it was. There was some open space, but it wasn't the kind of quality park that, as far as I was concerned, said to our children, you are valued, you're important, you deserve the best. This is my longtime childhood friend, Mike Williams. There used to be a sandbox years ago on this playground, and we met in the sandbox actually up here. It was over 200 businesses up and down 12th Street. Right. On the other side, you had businesses. Businesses, bike shops on this side of the corner, yeah. donut shops. It was like a, a downtown. And if you look, you say, well, how did all that fit in over here? Well, it did. On July 23rd, 1967, Detroit was hit by a riot. When I woke up that morning and opened up the door, all you seen was black smoke in the sky. As young as Kazi was, he remembers what happened. His stores along 12th Street looted and burned. Some people call it rebellion. Some people call it an uprising. And like I told anybody before, if you was over here, you actually knew what it was. It was a riot. Keep on riding until they stop on it. We didn't realize it until we got older how terrific it really was. I mean, and, and to come out of this is, is, is remarkable. I'm not going to even call it a park, I'm going to call it a venue. Because if you see this here stage, there's going to be plenty of entertainment, and we have exercise equipment over there. You have the playground equipment. So this is just more than a, just a park. And we've been waiting for this for 50 years. 
since I've been here for five years, you can see um, how the diversity has come through. And that's been such a, a pleasure to see in my neighborhood. And then to have this park, I think it'll bring everybody in the community together. As you can look around, you can see everybody's on a peaceful journey. And it's just really a wonderful experience. It represents that we're on the move to restabilizing our community, uh, creating uh, warmth, uh, safety, uh, homes. So we're, we're, we're creating an area now of uh, a new development. In just the past week, a sign went up on what used to be 12th Street, now Rosa Parks Boulevard. The vacant house undergoing renovation will become a local cultural center. This is the first phase, but then we go to the mixed use. This area will be developing like 40 lofts, on the first floor, there will be retail space. If all goes as planned, this will be the first commercial project on a plot of land where some original 12th Street businesses once stood, just a block from the intersection that changed Detroit history and across the street from a brand new Gordon Park. We've been here for over 70 years, our families, and we've been waiting for 50 years for something else to happen, and so this is the start. The police raid that sparked the violent summer of 1967 placed a spotlight on the racial tension between law enforcement and the African-American community. So, 50 years later, have relations between police and residents improved? Here to answer that question is Detroit Police Chief James Craig. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I actually want to start with uh, your memory of 1967. You were here in the city I was of here Detroit, in the city a of young Detroit. man, a very young man, right? Ten years old. Yeah, uh, and not far. You didn't live far from. Lived uh, on uh, Doris and Dexter uh, in the 10th precinct. My dad was a police reserve working out of the 10th precinct. Uh huh. So I had a, a, a deep connection to this community. Right. And 10 years later. 10 years uh, later, I'm a Detroit police officer. Right. Right. Very interesting. Working at working the 10th, at 10th precinct. <laughs> right. right. Full circle, right? Full circle. Yeah. So, so first, I want, uh, I want you to tell me what you remember your dad telling you about being a police officer in the city of Detroit in the 1960s, being a black police officer. Well, he was in a reserve the, officer. In the, in the city. And my dad served in the military, U.S. Mm -hmm. Army, mm -hmm. as a military police officer. Mm -hmm. And once he got discharged, he wanted to be a police officer, but because of but discrimination, couldn't. Right. couldn't. But he still wanted to give back. He still wanted to work in the police department in some capacity. So he was a city employee, but he was also a reserve officer. And so he told me the stories, him growing up as a young African-American man in this city, how yeah. it was like being approached by... Uh, the Detroit police officer, which then was a majority white police department. Yeah. Uh, I made up a mind at 10 years old. I didn't want anything to do with the Detroit police department. Is that right? <laughs> Nothing <laughs> to do. Yeah, you held, you right. held that uh, true, right? <laughs> well, I made 20 years old. I, d I decided to join. I guess I look back. My dad truly had an influence on yeah. me. But I think it was my welcome to the Detroit police department that will certainly, now that I have 40 years in this business, uh, will stay with me for the rest of my career. Yeah. And that was my welcome by a Detroit police officer. Senior officer, probably 25 years. And if you just think of the 10th precinct, 10 years after the civil unrest, many of the same officers that worked in the 10th precinct, were still there. they were still there. Yeah. So my partner looked at me, and I'll never forget, he just said, I don't want you here. You do one thing, just be black, don't talk to me, you're not going to drive this police car, and don't touch the radio. Wow. And I never forget. You this know, is in the late 1970s. This is 77. Yeah. Um, I started June 16th, 1977. And so I thought, this is certainly not what I want to do. And I remember talking to my dad about it. He said, we well, don't have much of a choice. Because if you want to be about change, you have to become part of that change effort. But I knew as a police officer, I could have only so much change. So I knew early in my career to have wholesale change, I needed to run the police department. Right. <laughs> right. And I knew it then. Yeah. And so I, I'm glad I look back now 40 years, best decision that I made, yeah. even though I left the city of Detroit uh, to pursue the career in another city, Los Angeles. But I'm glad I joined yeah. because I can tell you, and the, the question is, 
Has there been change? Yeah. Well, I can tell you. I mean, things get worse for a while after absolutely. the rebellion. Uh, the police department takes revenge, essentially, on the African-American community with the stress uh, unit that was stress, created. Stress uh, was just ended. Uh, I started in 77. Uh, I had a sergeant who had just been transferred. Uh, stress was abolished under Coleman Young. Right. So a lot of the vestiges of what went on. You're talking about a police culture. You cannot change a culture in 10 years. It just doesn't happen. Right. Yes, we had a black mayor. Yes, we had a black police chief by then. But to be candid, the culture existed. Now, the was same it same culture? Very close. Yeah. And then when you fast forward, after I left Detroit, we, we have other instances of major cases yeah. uh, that took place that led us into a federal oversight. Right, right. For and a very most, long time. For very, I mean, one of the longest running in the so, country. So talk about what you've been able to accomplish. I mean, I, almost anyone you ask uh, in the city will say things are better between the police and the community. Now, they're not perfect. We still have issues. Things come up. Incidents happen. But what are the things that made that change possible uh, under your leadership? Trust and engagement. And when I talk about engagement, you hear a lot of police departments, police chiefs talk about community policing. But what defines community policing? It's really a partnership. Police departments do it wrong when they go into communities and dictate, this is how we're going to police your community. That never works. That's the problem. But if you go back in time, even in the late 70s, Detroit was really a model for community policing. We had many stations. So there was a change then. But something happened because, one, there was very little investment in Detroit Police Department. Right. Would it surprise you to know that we were the third highest paid police department at one time in this country? And now... And, and now uh, we know. don't even match that of our suburban neighbors. Right. right. Something's inherently wrong. Four years ago when I started, this is what we know. Response time's over an hour. Clearance rates to homicide, embarrassingly low 11%. Right a community that had lost total confidence in the police department. The issues were there. And so now we look back just four years and we see that we have response times that replicate that of other major cities. Uh, we have a clearance rate that's above the national average. We have uh, community policing or neighborhood policing, as I like to refer to it, where we have neighborhood police officers in the neighborhood on the ground working closely with the community. That's the difference and it's based out of trust. You have no trust, you have no relationship. That is clearly the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, uh, but the, the, you, we still have this awful crime problem in the city. It's a very violent place, it's a very dangerous place if you live in certain neighborhoods. Uh, how much of the trust that you have from the citizens depends on you making the crime picture look a lot better. We can't do it alone. It's not enough of us. You know, the community has to be engaged. They have to be involved. And while I constantly talk about the fact that we are trending downward, we've seen the lowest homicide numbers that we've seen in 45 years. Still not enough. Sure. As you point out, per capita crime is still too high. But we can't do it alone. There are other issues, socioeconomic issues. We got this issue called uh, the mentally ill not being treated. Right, sure. We don't talk about those things. We, we talk about the education system. That has a direct impact. So when we look at our police officers, do we honestly believe that they are the sole solvers? We got something called courts. Yeah. We got prosecutors. Sure. So we have to be in this as one. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. Uh, uh, quickly, 50 years forward, what's the, what's the ideal situation between police and the community in Detroit? Well, you know, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a little biased. I think we've come a long way. I'm, I'm very proud of the work that our men and women do each and every day. You know, we've had the unfortunate distinction that 10 of our officers have been shot or killed in the last seven months. But despite that, our officers, generally speaking, do not overreact or underreact to situations. That says a lot when you talk about policing in a city where they know it's violent, right. but they still want to come back to work and serve these, uh, this city with uh, distinction and honor. And they do it each and every day. Yeah, well, uh, happy to have you here. Thank you. Congratulations on all the work. Okay, appreciate it. All right, we'll be right back to continue our conversation about the Detroit Rebellion with a group of Detroiters who have vivid memories of 1967. Stay right there.
Most Detroiters old enough to remember the rebellion have personal stories to tell about those tragic five days in July 1967. My next guests are here to share their experiences. Please welcome Reverend Joanne Watson, Loretta Holmes, and Kenneth Snodgrass. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Reverend Watson, I want to start with you. Uh, you, of course, were here in, in 1967 in Detroit, but uh, went on to a distinguished political career in our city as a, a member of our city council. Uh, talk about how much different things, I guess, are now than they were when you can remember uh, the things going wrong in 1967. Well, 1967, which was a rebellion, not a riot, it was a rebellion, <laughs> uh, changed my life. I was 16 and went to Central High School with these two individuals. Uh -huh. And we felt like it was at the epicenter of our neighborhood. There were tanks coming down our street. Uh, I'm the oldest of 10, the youngest of 10 is in the audience, <laughs> and we actually had to lay on the floor in our house. My father, my father and mother had to lay on the floor with us because if there, was, uh, if there were lights or even a flash of uh, fire from uh, someone turning the, the stove on, you could attract fire in your home. Yeah. So we were under siege and it was uh, uh, bone chilling. Yeah. We yeah. grew up, to, all adolescents went out the window as a result of 67. Uh, do, do you feel like the things you experienced then helped shape the things that you would go on to do later? Did that inspire you, for instance, to It's colored to get everything involved? that has happened in my life. Well, certainly, at the root of the rebellion was, was the response to police abuse and terrorism. So the fact that the first black mayor in Detroit, the Honorable Coleman Alexander Young, was elected be because he vowed to get rid of stress, stop yes. robberies, enjoy safety, which he did. Right. He kept that promise. Now, at that time, I was a young board member of the NACP. I had no idea I would later become the director of the <laughs> NACP, but as a young board member, we helped the Honorable Coleman Alexander Young because when he became mayor and absolutely implemented what he promised, he was sued yeah. by the union, the police union, the firefighters union, and the NACP. Uh, we joined uh, legally remember, to support yeah. the Honorable Coleman Alexander Young. So making sure that our city was respected and honored uh, was something that uh, I felt it in my bones, yeah. still feel it. It's colored <laughs> everything else in my life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Loretta, uh, talk about what your memory of, of 1967 was. Oh my God. Um, I was like a month until my 17th birthday. Mm -hmm. I worked at Ingleside Nursing Home. Um, as she said, we were classmates. We all graduated together. Mm -hmm. um, Ingleside was on Woodward and Claremont. And a friend of mine invited me to the club. It was a club to us, not a blind pig, <laughs> on 12th and Claremont. Uh -huh. So my best friend and I, we left work at 11.30 at night, had my oldest sister meet us there. And when we got there, as I remember, it was a long staircase going up to the building, uh, going upstairs, and you had to walk up all these <laughs> stairs. And when you get to the top of the stairs, you could see down the hallway, and it was a lot of doors, but they were all closed. Mm -hmm. um, to the left was the room that we go in, and it was a large pool table as you walk in the room, a bar, chairs, and tables people dancing, having a good time. It's just a, a club. Yeah. It, it was a club. And we were going there for someone's birthday party. I don't know whether he had, I was told he had just got, left, got out of Vietnam mm -hmm. or, or whatever it was. And uh, about 2.30, a quarter to three, my girlfriend and I, we said we got to leave because we had to be at work the next day. Whew. And so we started down these steep stairs, and by the time we got down by not even halfway, a sledgehammer came through the door. The door was like wood and glass, mm -hmm. and we saw this big white face. And it wasn't a police officer uniform, it was a, a white man in a shirt and tie. Mm -hmm. So we turned around and ran yeah. back up the stairs. When we got back up the stairs, we ran over to my sister to tell her what was going on, and in that time it was just, Everybody, just nobody knew what to do. Yeah. You just start her hearing uh, pounding on the doors like they were nailing all the doors shut so it could be one way in, one way out. The guys were pulling tables in the middle of the room because at that time, they was lowering ceilings. 
and the, some of the guys were crawling up in the ceilings to get away. To get away, yeah. So they lined us up in a single file. We're going down the stairs, stepping over glass and everything. And oh my God, when we got out on 12th Street, it was so many people. It was like a bullhorn. Somebody said, it's a party over here. People on cars, on top of buildings, wow. everywhere. They put us in paddy wagons, about four or five paddy wagons. And uh, I remember it was all women in our paddy wagon because I started hyperventilating. I didn't know what hyperventilating meant then, <laughs> but I knew I couldn't breathe. Right. It was so hot. And this lady slapped me, you know, like, get it together. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the crazy part is when they started taking us, they went down my street. I stayed on Elmhurst and Linwood. Mm -hmm. The police station was on Elmhurst and Livernoise. Uh -huh. And it's like passing your house. On the way to, on the, way to the police station. Yeah. Wow. And when we got there to the 10th precinct, I think it had to be that they took some men first because when we got there, you could see the men in their cells and they like, they had their shirts off, they had their do-rags on. <laughs> it was just like, crazy pandemonium mm -hmm. and they put all the women in one cell hmm. and that's where we were until maybe about five or six in the morning wow. and when they came in they said those that have a ticket or a warrant will be staying and they let my sister call my parents and we could hear my dad over the whole police station like what <laughs> type of thing right right and uh they let us out. We ended up walking home. We didn't know anything had started yeah. until uh, my friend and I, we got up to go to work because she was staying with us. The next day, my dad said, you know, the place you guys was in started the riot. We started. didn't even know what a riot was. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know. We went on to work. But we wasn't even there an hour, and it was like fire engines and police cars and smoke and everything. So they told us we could spend the night there at the nursing home yeah. or we could leave, so yeah. we left. Yeah. So when we got, we started walking home. Yeah, uh, uh, we we're gonna run out of time in the segment. But, I'm sorry. But, but I, I wanna give you a chance to, to talk about how that has shaped the rest of your life. I mean, it's such a, a vivid experience and it's right at the center of this event. What, 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 what did it uh, inspire in you later? You know what, to be honest with you, as I said, I was young. I really didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of things happening. It didn't hit me till I got older. When I drive through the old neighborhoods and say it's still like this, uh, when you try to explain to your your kids or or this is where I used to live, but it's not there anymore, right. or the whole block is gone. I don't know it. It hurts now more today because 50 years later, to me, there is no change. You can't see any difference. The, yeah. the neighborhoods, the education is so much worse. So wh nobody is telling the kids. I asked my grandkids that they ever hear. They don't know anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a moving story, and you were, again, right at the, at the center of all of that. Uh, Kenneth, I want to give you a, a chance to, to, to talk about your memory of 1967. I was just thinking that a lot of these issues, when we approach them, we do it from a mechanical way. Mm -hmm. And um, when I look at the 67 rebellion that took place, and even if you want to refer to it as a riot, is you have to look historically in regards to our society and, and politically, socially, and economically to see what... Uh, created the conditions for people to want to do something in those particular ways. Yes. Right. There was a lot of tension in regards to the African American community for a long time. Um, you got the worst jobs that was out there. You paid the most money for the food that was rottening in the stores. You had no dignity from the pe lot of the people who owned the stores that existed there. So even people who went out when the particular rebellion first started might have saw it as a riot. But there was people who came out and recognized this was a question of looking at how society treats African people here politically, socially, and econo economically. And when you look at that situation and see that African people, no matter what school you go to, the qu question of your progress and how you move up the economic ladder is really shattered because the racism continues to exist. That's right. And so with it, because of that nature, you have a depressed 
um, society, uh, ha half of a society being depressed. And the situation, even though we say we discussed in 1967, we have to recognize this go back to the enslavement process when sure. it began in this particular you country. You better say it. Mm -hmm. and not, it. Not just in 69, because that's where the tension came from. That's all right. of that period of people recognizing, here I have all of this schooling, I have all this knowledge, and I can only achieve a certain level, level because the racism continues to exist in society that holds you back. Yeah. So uh, talk about police brutality. Police was stealing more from African people than, than we African mm -hmm. people stole during the rebellions. <laughs> right. uh, right. More yes. people got killed by yes. police. That's right. Because of that, the nature of the, the racism inside like so, our society. Like the Algiers Motel right. murder. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So those kind of things, we have, to, we have to bring the light right now so that we don't right. approach it and think this was just a, a, a limited period That's where right. something took right. place. There was a big... Um, situation in 68 with the killing of Martin Luther King. That's right. Now, here's a person who says, I don't believe in violence, I believe in nonviolence, and, and you, he gets assassinated. And then you turn around and have a, a, a group of people saying, well, we have to grow our own food and so forth, the new Republic of New Africa. That's right. And they having a big mead conference, and, uh, and they, they right. get raided by the right. police. That's and right. And go and to Rebecca shoot Baptist in the church. Right. That's right. So we have a lot of tension, which is inside of a lot of people that's been caused because the question of racism in this society. And again, African people cannot be racist. Right. You can be prejudiced. Right. Racism, you have it's to ha power, economically, politically, and socially be able to enforce That's right. that. Yes. yes. That's yeah. exactly well, right. That <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. All right, we've gone over our time, okay. but I want to thank all of you for being here. Despite the racial injustice and the other issues that fueled the civil disturbance, 1967 was a kind of hopeful time in the city's history. The neighborhood around 12th and Claremont was teeming with businesses, and the nearby Motown recording studio was producing mega hits. Local writer Marsha Music and Detroit historian Jamon Jordan take us on a tour. Here's Motown. The Hitsville House over here to our left. And this was most often my dad's route mm -hmm. on the way to the record shop. When I didn't have to go to school, I'd have to go to the record shop and help dad at the record shop, my little brother Daryl and I. We would get right up here to the corner, past Hitsville. And then you're right here on 12th. And 12. you're right here on 12th Street. That show you just how close Motown was to the street where the unrest took place. That's right, that's right, it's very close. Very close. Just as we're entering 12th Street, we can see, immediately you start seeing all this green space. Yes. And of course, this wasn't green space. Exactly. In 1967. This was very dense and teeming with businesses, commercial spaces, stores, shops, restaurants, uh, grocery stores. Uh, all the way down, as far as you can see, really, that's right, that's right. Uh, on both sides of the street. Yes. Uh, but one thing about this is that a reason why there is so much green space going back toward those houses on either side is because the buildings were destroyed. That's right. That came right up to the sidewalk. That's right, that's right. This empty space was where my dad's record store was. Oh, wow. Right, right here. Right next to, right, right here. around the corner. From right here. From Tanya Blandick's house. I wow. was on 12th Street between Philadelphia and Euclid. Wow. Right, here we are on Chicago Boulevard. Yes, yes. And I love driving down this street because it really gives, especially an outsider, a chance to see the grandeur in which many Detroiters lived. Mm -hmm, that's right. Uh, the extraordinary architecture that marked uh, so many of the neighborhoods here. And this neighborhood here called Boston Edison is a real exemplar of areas for affluent Detroiters, but this became an area that even working class Detroiters were able to live in, particularly after the years of white flight. This was an area that was also gravely affected by the unrest and the fires, etc. As we're driving down um, Linwood, we get to the the field of Central High School. And so really Central High School, their field is almost like a campus. 
and in 1967, this would be the staging area and the camp area for the National Guard. So the National Guard was stationed right here. On the east side, at Southeastern, the Army was there. But the National Guard was stationed right here at Central High School. A house painter named Joe Nelson was driving by and he had driven by this sculpture of Jesus many times going to work and of course it was always painted white and this gate wasn't here at that time and went in with his ladder and painted the face and the hands of Jesus black this was his way of participating in the uprising by painting that Jesus black and now the seminary maintains it as black to show their solidarity with the african-american community Joe Nelson was my older cousin. He was oh my, my grandmother's. Goodness. He was my grandmother's nephew. You know, history is alive, as that's we right, say. That's right. And often, in retrospect, we don't realize when history closes over a, a time, hmm. we don't realize how close some of these things really are that's to right. people. That's right. After the uprising, the city struggled with how to heal the racial and economic wounds that remain. Several nonprofit organizations were founded with the goal of improving the quality of life for African Americans. Joining me now from institutions that were established following the rebellion are Focus Hope CEO Jason Lee and Rod Gillum, trustee emeritus at New Detroit. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I'm going to start with you. Focus Hope, founded by Eleanor Josias and uh, Father uh, Bill Cunningham in uh, 1968. The, the, the idea was we can do better than this. We can do better by our own people here in the city of Detroit. Fifty years later, are we? Well, I think that the uh, challenges that uh, created the 1967 civil unrest or riots uh, are still prevalent here today in our community. We have not fixed education. We, um, and every day we at Focus Hope see the product of a failed education system, a failed incarceration system, coming through our doors looking for hope, uh, yeah. looking for training, looking for opportunities, and we're there every day to support them in that initiative. Um, so we are still seeing those challenges, and I don't believe we fixed the problem today. Yeah. Uh, Rod, New Detroit was aimed specifically at that racial gap uh, between uh, Detroiters, making that a little more harmonious. Uh, sometimes I think eh, we're making some progress there. Other times <laughs> I want to throw something through a window. Uh, it's yeah. it's uh, two, uh, one step ahead, two steps back sometimes. So if you look at 67 and, uh, and the reaction to what was happening in the environment at that time, when you applied for a job, when you went to go buy or rent a home, or uh, your interaction with the police department, um, all of which had an environment that this population was less than. Mm -hmm. um, and in that context, in, in New Detroit kind of came out and said, we need to talk about that because that's not the feeling in this community. It should never be the feeling in this community. So race became front and center. And with the establishment of New Detroit, uh, really the impetus was Governor Romney making a phone call saying sure. that the public institutions have failed uh, the, this black population. We need to step up to that. And so this New Detroit coalition was, uh, was formed at that time yeah. and continues today. Yeah. Uh, how much has the conversation changed in 50 years? Are we talking about the same things or are they different? I think these issues are still, still the same. Yeah. They exhibit themselves in different ways, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps in some instances not as blatant, uh, but still the divide is there. And what New Detroit intends to do is to make issues around race very visible, uh, to engage others, uh, to make certain that there are very candid discussions specifically targeted on that word. I mean, if you're going to have racial healing, then it has to be something as a result of dialogue and other perspectives. And New Detroit, kind of the coalition of business, for-profits, non-profits, labor, uh, various ethnic groups as well, all who are engaged in conversations around race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, Focus Hope is really, uh, really geared up to try to solve the employment problems that we have uh, here in Detroit. Um, talk about how that looks maybe worse now than it did uh, 50, 50 years ago. I mean, there are people 
being left behind in new ways, I feel like, in the city of Detroit. Right, so the average person coming through uh, our doors in our workforce training programs, they all have either a GED or high school diploma. Unfortunately, when we test an individual, they're testing at middle school levels. Yeah. And so the- Even though they've been graduated from our school system or some other. Absolutely, yeah. so the education crisis is, is so significant and it plays out beyond just the K-12 experience. Um, and, and we see this every day, about 25% uh, of our students, or actually to a third, have some level of incarceration on their record. Um, and then over 50% of our population coming through for workforce training is dealing with poverty situations and challenges. Not it, now also dealing with mental health. You, 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 you create a package where individuals are, are struggling with things that are so systematic. And what we do at Focus Hope, we provide not only a level of academic and workforce training, we also provide a level of support that oftentimes these individuals don't have within their respective households or within their respective family structures. Right. And that's what makes us more successful than others. Yeah. Uh, what about the availability of jobs? jobs in the city of Detroit. I mean, e even if you can uh, get to the place where you're qualified, have the skills, right. still tough to find employment. Absolutely, and, and the critical is the lack of transportation to those jobs uh, from a regional standpoint. Traditionally, the African-American community has had opportunities in manufacturing. Well, many of the manufacturing plants are outside the boundaries of the city of Detroit right. in most cases. How do you get there right. if you live in, in many parts of the city? And so the jobs that are being created downtown have a more of a technology, more have a higher pedigree of uh, academic and experiences that many individuals um, are having challenges uh, in terms of meeting. Yeah, uh, that support that you guys give, that's so important. Uh, if, you, if you didn't have to do that, uh, uh, it seems like we'd be much further ahead. There, the other institutions who are supposed to be supporting people are still Still failing. Yes, yeah, so we see this in the uh, the uh, retention within the community colleges and the four institutions, as well as entry into, say, uh, apprenticeship programs uh, throughout the region. Um, and we have taken a different approach, engaging individuals where they are academically, social, emotionally, and providing a triage of services that make them successful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jason Lee, Rod Gillum, thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Steve. Absolutely. All right, coming up next, how the events of 1967 are affecting the city's future and the impact it's having on Detroit's emerging leaders. Stay right there. My next guests were not even born in 1967, for that matter, nor was I, but we can all also reflect on the events of that summer to better understand how our lives are affected today. Please welcome Lauren Hood of Live Sex Alliance and Eric Thomas of Saga Marketing. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having us. So, I, as I said, I wasn't born in 1967 either, <laughs> but uh, I, I feel like the, the rebellion framed my childhood in some ways. I mean, you, you hear it all the time from your parents, from your grandparents. There are these stories, there are these places uh, that were affected by it, and it sort of shapes the way you think about the city uh, uh, for, for a long time. Talk about sort of that effect on, on you. Um, well, what's interesting for me is I'm realizing that I didn't hear too much about what actually happened growing up. So everything I heard about the riot, I think, came from like school books and conversations that my white friend's parents were having. But I didn't have a real conversation with my parents about it until maybe like 10 years ago. Wow. Um, wow. And realizing that like, and it started because my grandmother lived on Claremont. Okay. And I just had a revelation one day. I'm like, Mom, did Grandma <laughs> live on the street? Wasn't where that, the... Uh, and she's right. like, yes, right at 12th Street. I'm like, how have we never had this conversation? Yeah. And my father's mother lived on Atkinson right around the block. And we had never had this real talk about what actually happened. So um, my um, understanding of what really went down came much later yeah. than, you know, all those false narratives that I had heard. So I went to private school uh -huh. um, and a lot of the things I heard about the city that were negative came from like my white parents' friends. So, saying, yeah. saying that this was like a turning point. Uh, yes, and how are you still living in Detroit, and isn't it awful there, and when, are you, when is your family going to leave? Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, so 
<laughs> yeah. I've, I've had a lot of unlearning to do uh, in yeah, the past and, few uh, years. Wh wh what has that looked like, uh, to, uh, sort of going back over that ground to get a different perspective? Um, well, it, it's something to, yeah. to understand that something you held on to as a truth for like part of your adult life, like childhood and part of your adult life was like it's totally wrong. True. Yeah, it's yeah. not the whole story. Um, so I still have more to learn. Like when I got asked to do this, I'm like, do I know enough about this to like be up there and be on a panel? <laughs> There's it, so many layers yeah. and yeah. so much, so much of it plays into your psychology that you have no recollection of like what you believe is possible for you, what you believe can happen in your community. Like we had a youth conversation with our org recently and like asked this young 18 year old, like, what do you need? We're like thinking he's going to say basketball playgrounds. He said hope and faith. Yeah. So wow. I feel like generation upon generation of people not believing that things could get better, that not, not believing that opportunities were for them. Like it's still, it's in this 18 year old who just said he needed hope and faith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you write a lot about uh, <laughs> living here in the city of Detroit, what it means yeah. to be uh, a Detroiter. Talk about how what happened in 67 before you were born shapes your your vision of, of Detroit today. So I, so I just just missed 67 by 20 years, right? I was born in 87. <laughs> Only 20 years. So I just <laughs> lightly dodged the teens of weeks. Um, but you know, it's interesting. I've always been fascinated with systems. You know, how, how do systems impact peoples? And I, I've always said this thing, you know, if, if one fish dies, right, you check the fish. If all the fish die, you check the water, <laughs> right? If, if you look at a city like Detroit with this much uh, economic disparity and this much educational deficit, I've always been going, how is that possible? I mean, if you look at the story of 67, the biggest thing that doesn't make sense is, and this is the story they tell you, one day blacks went crazy. <laughs> well, everyone lost their mind. Absolutely right. not. I mean, absolutely. If, if you begin to look into just the history of America, I mean, it, if the first man flight, right, was in 1903, right, and to space, it mm -hmm. was in 1961, mm -hmm. right? That means we're almost between that amount of time from people standing on the ground to getting into outer space yeah. from the 67 riots, right? Yes. If there hasn't been that much change, you have to start questioning the systems and where we are actually yeah. living. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and do you and feel like the Detroit that you live in today is not sufficiently changed from 67. I live in a mm -hmm. weird Detroit, right? Yeah. I grew up on Joy Road and Greenfield mm -hmm. in these streets, right? In, in, in the hood, <laughs> if you will. Um, but now I live in Alden Park Tower, right mm -hmm. next to West Village. Mm -hmm. But I've always, I've always argued that I don't understand this idea of the tale of two Detroits. When I lived in the hood, there was still Palmer Park. That mm -hmm. was two Detroits for me too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, are we more upset that um, there's a disparity in power and income, or are we disparate that it doesn't look like us anymore? Well, and so, I mean, like, poverty didn't change for my family. When the mortgage crisis happened, we were still poor. Right. Um, <laughs> in the same way as it happened, my family still live in the same house in the hood. Mm -hmm. So, for me, the resurgence of Detroit, as much as you can say that, I mean, 7.2 isn't, is a, isn't a resurgence mm -hmm. out of 142. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it has been good for my business, but has it been good for the people that I care about? Not yeah. necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, Lauren, the, the work that you're doing is right around, uh, you know, living away six mile, uh, a neighborhood that represents lots of different parts of Detroit, lots of different dynamics in Detroit. D do you feel like uh, the 67 rebellion frames that work in any important way or frames those neighborhoods still? Sure. Way. Well, uh, one of the neighborhoods in particular, Fitzgerald, I can think of a number of elders who, when I get their origin story, I'm like, when did you come here? They're like 67. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those places that black people were allowed to live in mm -hmm. at that time. When you were trying to get away from 12th and Claremont and move outward, it was aspirational to go to the northwest side. Right. Um, so yeah, I know for at least one of the neighborhoods, that's a big part of why people are there. Yeah. And a big part of why people take ownership of the place. So when you look at a neighborhood that it's undergoing rapid change and you want to know like why are residents so angry and why are they so nervous and um what why does all that tension exist is because this was one of the few places they could go and they've been there like for 50 60 years right. um there are several generations of families living on one block so when you're like why is it such a big deal to make change happen in this neighborhood that's why yeah yeah and their expectations understandably are for something Better. Something that includes them, yeah, first right. of all. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, don't write them yeah. out, right? <laughs> don't draw them off the Yeah, map. and a collective definition of what better is. Yes, yes. All right, uh, Lauren and Eric, thank you both for being here.
I think the best way to think of 1967 is in terms of both past and present. The past being what happened before the uprising and the present being what we've learned since. I wish I could sit here and say, we did it, we won. We confronted all of the things that confounded us back then and we beat them. But look around, poverty, racism, other forms of inequality, they are all still with us. They all still shape this city and this region in deep and difficult ways. If we can claim anything though, I think it's that 50 years later, so many more people seem to get it. They know what 1967 was about. They see the shadow it casts forward into 2017, and they're willing in many instances to talk about it, to discuss what hasn't changed and what we have to do to be sure that change happens at some point, hopefully before another half century passes. This is one of the strongest communities I have ever known. It's resilient, tough, even unbeatable. And that's what tells me more than anything else that we can do it and that we will. That's gonna do it for this special edition of American Black Journal. Our special thanks to the Joseph Walker Williams Center and the Detroit Historical Society. For more information about today's guests, you can go to AmericanBlackJournal.org and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. American Black Journal on the road is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Four Fun gave me a scholarship to help me attend Eastern Michigan University. I developed a passion for engineering at an early age. It started off with something as simple as fixing bikes. I didn't know anything about a bike shop or where I could go to get it fixed, so I just kind of had to play around with it myself. You can't really do everything on your own, so with even the smallest amount of help, just a little push, it can get you to where you need to be.